right now. So I'm Ni Cheng Liang. I am an adult pulmonologist here in San Diego. I'm also a cancer survivor and as a result, a mindfulness teacher. Um, I've been teaching now for nine plus years and have been in the physician wellness space for quite some time teaching uh, all levels of healthcare trainees and knowing the plight of the burnout epidemic that's going on amongst healthcare professionals, knowing that that was just going to get worse, especially with the coronavirus pandemic. I founded the Mindful Healthcare Collective, um, and with the help of a lot of the executive board that's here today, we have put on over 100 free online live sessions for healthcare professionals as well as the general public. And we also started a book club. And so it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Rhonda McGee. She is a professor of law at um, the University of San Francisco. And in the mindfulness community, I feel like we don't really need to introduce her because she is um, so famous and such a well-respected international mindfulness teacher. She is truly an expert on the intersection of race and mindfulness. And um, there are so many other accolades, including that she's a fellow of the Mind and Life Institute, which is the institute that was uh, started by His Holiness the Dalai Lama on really research in contemplative practices. Um, she's also on the board of advisors of the University of Massachusetts Center for mindfulness amongst other accolades. She's also a very prolific writer. Not only has she written this book that I have like tabbed every single page of, um, but also many, many articles. And she's been on many podcasts such as the 10% Happier podcast with Dan Harris. So without further ado, Professor McGee, thank you and welcome. <laughs> ah, my gosh. This was, uh, it was such a joy to hear from you uh, and be invited into this beautiful, um, critically important circle. I have so much respect for all that you are and all that you're doing. I'm just, you know, I'm, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so mutual fangirl them happening. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to start off by offering just that very simple practice that I call uh, I See You, a practice for intentionally gathering a circle of practice and learning. And it, of course, we, there are many ways we can intentionally come together for practice and learning. This is just one that um, is just a very simple invitation to a kind of Ha, huh, disrupt the typical ways we sometimes find ourselves being moving, moving into Zoom, right? Where we're sort of like, we can lean on back and just kind of oh, zoom it in. And the invitation here, and I do this in my classes actually, but I've been doing it on Zoom too. The invitation is to really um, check in with ourselves. Are we willing to be seen? Are we willing to be seen by this group today, right here, right now? And then check in and ask, are we willing to see each other? Are we willing to see and be seen? Okay, and if our answer is yes, some quality of yes, right? <laughs> it could be like a tentative yes on one or the other. The invitation is to try to sort of really amp that up, right? And lean in and take each other's faces in, in person, I literally invite folks to kind of look into each other's eyes. And I think it's a little challenging with Zoom. With me, I'm over here in San Francisco with the sun all in my face right now, sunset. But I, and nevertheless, I want to lean in with you. Because, you know, we're at a moment right now, you all know, we're all struggling. We have all um, felt ourselves more bereft of human contact, many, many of us. Um, than we're used to, even those of us who consider ourselves introverts, who travel everywhere but are introverts. Uh, I miss people. 
And so the invitation is to check into um, that longing that we have to, to connect and to see if we're willing to experiment with connecting a little bit more richly on Zoom. So in whatever way it's possible for you right now to kind of look into each other's faces, um, I might, I don't know if I can do this, take my glasses off here and really kind of see if I can see you. And BC, I see Trish, I see some folks that I have had the pleasure of meeting in, in person and being with in person. Cheryl on Facebook a lot, hello, my dear. Um, so I just wanna say, yeah, let's take this moment, take each other's faces in as best we can and honor each other's real being. Because we know even as we're just meeting for the first time, uh, the miracle of our lives and the stories that we all carry and the lineages that we represent when we come into a circle like this, right? We are the earth that walks, we are cultures that walk, that walk into conversation together. So just taking a moment to really offer that respectful gaze to each other and to feel what it's like to, to reach into being seen, to see and be seen as a ground for teaching and learning together um, and building community as we go. You all know that part of what I do, of course, is help support this approach to teaching and learning called contemplative pedagogy where we're really honoring this sort of reality of the lived experiences that we all represent, right? The sort of unfathomably complex and diverse experiences that every single human being brings into any room, right? And from which every single one of us has so much to teach each other and um, we can all learn from each other in so many beautiful ways. And when it comes to this issue of working around, looking more carefully at racism and working for racial justice, that's an area in particular where I think we need to remind ourselves um, that while we all have these you know, almost again, unfathomably unique experiences in life, we've all walked exquisitely different paths to get into this conversation. Um, and yet, because we're human, there are ways we can understand each other, right? Um, so we both have so much to offer in terms of how it is that race, racism, knowing something about how, ident how identity shows up in the world. And yet some of us are more comfortable talking about these aspects of ourselves, especially race. Some of us have much more pain and trauma associated with these aspects of our experience than others. So to say that we all have something to teach is not to say that we all in any way have like, I mean, it's not about trying to measure equal, you know, equal stories or any of that. It's just honoring and respecting that we each have something. We each know a lot more. If we spend any time in the Western world or any world, but especially in the US, we know a lot more about race and racism than we are often given to name, to talk about, especially if you're white racialized, as you all know, but not only white racialized people, there can be a kind of um, epistemology of ignorance around race and racism, a kind of training to not know and rewarding for not knowing. And we actually saw a beautiful teaching, actually, sadly, I say beautiful, but it's, um, when I say what I'm, what I'm thinking of, you'll know what I mean by the dual meaning of that. Good teaching, but painful. Today in the Supreme Court hearings with um, the candidate for the Supreme Court, having um, Senator um, Cory Booker kind of detail First ask her if she knew anything about race and racism in the criminal justice system, how black men in particular or black people in particular fair um, struggle uh, for justice under the system. And, and basically she said she, you know, she'd had some conversations but she'd never really read an article or a book or any kind of thing about it. And so 
that was that moment of like, aha, there it is. There it is again. There it is again. So uh, part of why I wrote the book that I wrote was to disrupt these patterns of learned ignorance and um, learned silence around race and racism. We know a lot. And although it can be painful to talk about and to figure out how to redress racism, right? It's like, I happen to have met and spent a little bit of time in an earlier part of my life with Kamala Harris, our current VP nominee on the Democratic side. We're both, we were both young lawyers in San Francisco some time ago. And I remember she and I were at an event, actually the time we first met, we were at a Chinese for Affirmative Action event, actually. And um, we're seated beside each other. And um, actually we had a speaker who was talking about racism against Asian Americans, um, drawing on the experience of the Korematsu decision that um, justified the internment of Japanese Americans um, in World War II. And he was actually a descendant of one of the internees as many Asian Americans in California are. And um, he was just detailing, you know, that particular aspect of American racist history and the law and the impact of it. And I still remember Kamala leaned over to me and was just like, racism, I'm just so sick of racism. It's like, you know, that ex-boyfriend you they thought you may have gotten over, you tried to break up with, and here he is again. It's like racism keeps coming back and we get tired of it. But it's a part of our, our lives. And some of us, you know, have no choice but to be dealing with it. Others of us can avoid it. So I wrote the book to try to create more opportunities for us to figure out how to, to sort of deepen our ability to stay in the conversations and to do the work of racial justice together. So I, I thank you all, those of you who have had the chance to read the book or read some aspects of my writings. I'm honored deeply by that. And if there are any questions or reflections, um, I really am here to, to be with you, not to speak at you, but to hear from you, hear what your experiences have been like on this journey. So thank you. Thank you, Professor, for all your hard work um, ongoing work, just fangirl <laughs> moment. <laughs> I'm going to start off the questions with um, asking you for any words of wisdom for so much suffering that's happening right now between the pandemic, between the current political climate and the increased racist tensions. What words of wisdom do you have for us as um, many of us being healthcare professionals who are witnessing the suffering, who are suffering ourselves. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And all I can say is um, I'm humbled by the question. Um, I think, uh, you know, I don't presume to have all of the answers or to be any iota more wise than you who are kind of bearing up in the midst of all of this, showing up every day and doing the best you can. Um, but I do, you know, I do feel that this, this moment has been a deep teaching, hasn't it, about so many things. And um, one of the things I think for me it's deepening my ability to, to do the work of, of self-care and to see that as an aspect of justice. You know, I write, I write about this. I, I use the phrase personal justice. Um, and this is not an easy thing to talk about because we know that, um, you know, for those of us who do any kind of uh, socially engaged service work, we're, we're, we're always aware of, of how much suffering there is and how much more there is to do and any degree to which we're out of the suffering, we immediately aware of our own relative privilege and, and it can be kind of difficult to, 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 to recognize when we do need to take care of ourselves or to, if we recognize it, to really respond to the call and take care. But I'm thinking of, um, 
Yeah, self-care as maybe the first approximation of justice, right? Our, because for me, if you know, if we are just thinking about that that day, that distant day when it all comes together and we've fought the fight and we've won the war battle and we've elected the people and changed the policy, and only on that day will we rest and feel the preciousness of our lives. Something is wrong with that idea, I think. I think what for me the goal is 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 in some measure to begin to carve out spaces where we feel the justice that we're seeking right here, right now between and amongst us. And we can do that. Not, you know, we don't wanna miss the fact that we have power, uh, even as we seek to, you know, kind of disrupt patterns of oppression. I think it's a false placement of too much power in the hands of others, right? To, to not recognize the power that we have. So a big part of what I think we might do uh, during this time is to name as a part of our work the creation of spaces where we can actually feel the freedom that we're fighting for. We can feel it in these individual spaces. We know this. And the idea is can we expand it beyond our personal homes and families of deep support? But can we expand it to places where we come together like this, workplaces, practice spaces? And what does it look like? What would it look like for us to create these spaces where we can feel the liberation that we, we seek? It's not gonna look the same for all of us. Can we have the conversation that would allow us to build those kinds of spaces? The other thing I'm thinking of is um, my friend and teacher, uh, uh, pa Patricia Mushim Ikeda, uh, who wrote and writes about the vow not to burn out the vow that we must take not to burn out. We could so easily, so easily burn out, right? And sometimes for me, I think of you, you and folks like you who are doing medical care work. And I, in particular, whenever I'm feeling like I'm just, you know, I just got to lie, lie down on the floor and feel the earth hold me for a while because it's more than I can bear. I'm just really needing that extra, just like I surrender. And I do, that is a kind of a practice I do sometimes. Surrender, be held by the earth, just be held by the bed, held, let it go. But whenever I'm feeling somehow that maybe I won't be able to get back up, I think of, you know, where, where who is that in my mind, the pediatric oncologist, that doctor who's treating children who have cancer, right? Or some other, right, specialist who's doing the kind of work that would break my heart to know that like at the end of my life, there will still be children who suffer. I couldn't heal them all. And yet you do, we do the work, you all do the work. You all take care, even though you know there'll be people coming in the door the next day. That I think of that, I really honestly think of the, uh, the exquisite courage. And I, I use the word love for this kind of work. I don't know if you do, right? We do this work out of love. And we resist injustice out of love. And in a certain sense, they come together. So, so those are just to kind of recognize the, the, the aspect of justice that is about love and that must include ourselves, even as we work to advance the cause of justice for others. And um, really to allow ourselves to have these big dreams and visions about how we can create these spaces where we can feel the justice amongst ourselves right here, right now, and not wait for that distant day. And that lastly about that, I'll just say Alice uh, Walker, author of The Color Purple, um, a woman whose you know, teachings I've benefited from and have met as well. And recently she was at a gathering of black Buddhist teachers where I was pri privileged to be a part of, of the circle and um, one of the things she wanted us to, to take away from that was to remember, especially those of us who know something about suffering, it's especially our call to not forget the joy, right? To not forget, right? That color purple, she said, that was a book about kind of Buddhist awakening to joy. Don't miss the color purple or whatever that color is, that's yours. Or whatever that sunset is, right? You know what I'm saying. Don't miss these things, even as we work for justice. So those are the things that come up. Uh, 
I feel like this is like a Dharma talk on on racial justice and <laughs> such such nuggets of, of gold and wisdom here. Um, I have so many questions, but uh, one that that has been brought up, I think, in the in the press, and um, it's about the terminology of color blindness versus like your curriculum color insight and how how some people use the term color blindness as identification with not being racist when in fact it couldn't be more false do you want to make a couple of comments about like the definitions and um, what the ideal would be in terms of getting rid or with compassion and curiosity trying to change the minds of quote unquote colorblind people <laughs> knowing that we can't change actions or thoughts of others however hard we try we can share our thoughts and views and wisdom to try to influence yeah thank you i mean this is a challenging one um because you know i i try to presume um, that people are making their best efforts from based on where they are and what they've seen. And I know that this culture has trained a lot of us in this idea that colorblindness is the way to go. Um, it was the intentional effort of a generation of people, actually a lot of whom were in law. So a lot of important cases came down underscoring this idea of colorblind jurisprudence around race. And again, parroting and uh, re like echoing the language of Martin Luther King, wanting our kids to be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin, right? There are some progressive language and highly aspirational um, uh, uh, rhetoric that has been, um, that, that many people point to as, as, as a justification for why that is the approach that we should take. And, and I understand that. So I think um, the challenge is to help people un help reveal the way that this desire for colorblindness um, has turned against the cause of progressive racial justice in so far as it's made it hard for us then to actually talk about race and racism because uh, to the degree it's still here. <laughs> um, the other thing I like to say about color blindness is, is how interesting it is that, you know, you never have people say, I'm gender blind. I mean, if somebody tried to say, I just don't even notice <laughs> uh, genders, <laughs> we would say, hmm, you know, good luck trying to, right? <laughs> of course we do. Of course we do. We're, we're, we are neurobiologically, right, um, you know, trained to do it. We're socially trained to do it. Um, we can try to train ourselves to minimize the way in which we might be biased around, let's say, gender, right? And we all have been trained to have biases around gender. You can't not in this culture, I don't think. I was talking to somebody, a group recently about how being on a plane, I traveled a lot. I'm traveling a lot less these days, but some of the times being on those jets, I remember, you know, a particular time when I was on a huge jet, maybe flying from San Francisco to, to, to Boston. And, you know, the pilot comes on, you know, this is the captain. We're flying from blah, blah, blah. This is, you know, this is a co-pilot, such and such. And we're going to, and the first time the captain and co-pilot and all were female voices or female names. I myself remember having a kind of a, like a moment. You know, and I'm, I'm a law professor. I want women to do everything they want to do. And nevertheless, in me, I had some sort of subtle like, okay, you know, that bias that had trained me to expect to hear a male voice come out of the cockpit when the captain would be speaking. I think that is the kind of thing that is real and we're up against. And so, you know, just as we know that we notice gender and, you know, we've all been trained to make something or other of, of gender and um, sexuality and uh, gender expression, and all of these things. 
to say then at the same time, somehow we weren't trained to make different things of race and racism, we weren't trained to notice it, it's just really, it's quite absurd actually. But yet we've been trained to say those sorts of things. So yeah, my color insight is really the invitation to sort of take the, um, take the teachings of cognitive scientists who tell us that our brains are naturally noticing um, social cues of who belongs, who doesn't, who's re respected in a particular hierarchy. Cognitive scientists tell us this. Social psychologists tell us this, that we stereotype, that we all carry certain types of biases. To me, it doesn't make any sense at all to get this scientifically grounded information and then go out socially and say, well, but I'm colorblind. It's like, I might want to not be biased. I think that's the aspiration we should all have. We want to work with our biases and minimize them. The good news is we can do this. Um, coming together, there's a lot of research that shows that coming together in, a, in certain sorts of ways, the contact hypothesis, some of you may be familiar with this. This is a, the insight that helped um, fuel the research that supported the desegregation movements, starting in the military, starting in schools, et cetera, et cetera. There's been decades and decades and decades of information gathering around how, how we can bring groups together for positive intergroup interaction. We know how to do it. People have been researching it and we have just tossed it out the window in the last decade or so in favor of a resurgence of tribalism, a resurgence of the idea that we need to kind of that you know integration somehow doesn't work. So um, yeah, I mean, and I, so I wrote the book because that's you know um, seeing all of that and seeing how we are suffering unnecessarily in this beautiful country, built on this highly aspirational vision or dream. Let's just say I won't say it was founded in the constitutional sense on that dream, but I'm going to say founded in the political community that created by our ancestors here, right? Our ancestors on this, you know, on this earth have keep, continued to make something of this dream called America, right? That is about a place for all of us. And, um, and so when I, you know, for me watching the, the harm that colorblindness continued to do, and you can see it a lot in law and policy, that's, uh, that moved me to wanna write about how we can turn toward race, know it, speak about it, and at the same time, not let it be, and not let the conversation about race be an excuse to go back into our trainings around us versus them, um, hierarchy and separation. So to heal the separations, to do justice, to make peace, that was what the, all of these things were underlying the work of color insight for me. I see there's a question here in the chat and Yvonne I think had had her hand up before. Is this the question you put in the chat Yvonne? Speaking of how we have been trained, what practices can you recommend for letting go of the internalization of these biases? Including white supremacy by minorities. Hello, right? I mean, wow, big question. This has been the biggest insight for me realizing the ways in which I've been complicit as a woman of color, yeah. I mean, I think um, Yvonne, am I pronouncing that right? Yvonne, is it Yvonne? Yeah, Yvonne, Yvonne, yeah. Thanks. Nice to meet you. You too, beautiful to meet you. Thank you for this question too. And the, on the, the kind of candor of it. You know, most of us never get to this. And I mean, it's hard to get to this acknowledgement that we have all internalized various kinds of biases. This is not to say that our work is all equal. I firmly believe every individual has a kind of a unique personal curriculum around working with their biases because they were, or they're all looking very differently. We've been raised in different time spaces, cultures, heritages, parents, all that, personalities. What's the personal curriculum? And so I love that you're asking, you know, like, what is it for me? And um, I've written about that in this book in some measure, and all I can say is it's, the, it's ongoing work to think about what are the biases that I have internalized and to be, have the courage and the love and to surround ourselves with the kind of courageous people who can hear us say that 
and not, you know, poo poo it and not say, oh, no, but really they're the problem. We all have some work to do. We just do. I mean, you can see it. Look at the look at the look at the way I've worked with police officers. Um, I'm not here to, you know, paint them all in one light. I've been myself a member of the military. Some of y'all know that maybe maybe most of you don't. So so I, I understand these kinds of trainings. Um, and I understand how many people can be motivated to serve others through that. But I also see how, um, you know, anti-Black, for example, discrimination can happen amongst police of any color. I've heard it justified by police of all different backgrounds. And there's a, some reason for that we can't go into and completely unpack here. But it's just to say that we, you know, the research confirms that internalized bias is a very real phenomenon. So I think the first step is to acknowledge it, just like any kind of bias. The first step always has to be to acknowledge it. You cannot heal what you will not face, right? James Baldwin, of course, said it more eloquently than I just did. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until or unless it is faced. Full stop. So if we can acknowledge that we, any of us, have bias, and it's so hard. It's actually very hard. And I hear people saying, you know, I, 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 they, they, they've been raised not to admit it or not to acknowledge it. Um, all of us get different trainings. White racialized people are raised that, you know, they're going to be um, thrown out of the culture of I don't know what, right? Y'all know this better than I. What are the things that have kept you, in your experience, unable to name and admit the biases you carry? And each of us, again, may have some different work to do to see that, to acknowledge it, to work with it, and to uproot it, because we are not going to recreate the world that we know we deserve unless we all see our part of this. And again, for people of color, it's especially challenging because many of us are traumatized by anti-POC racism and bias. And so we're kind of like, look, I just need to have somebody understand what it's like to be pervasively enmeshed in whiteness and the struggle of that before I can start actually naming the work I got to do. So I understand the challenge of it. And this is one of the reasons why I think having affinity group spaces is helpful for some of a lot of us having our own like. And I wish I had more time because I'm going to have to get off soon. <laughs> and of course, you know, I could keep talking about this. But just to say, um, I was in South Africa a couple, a couple of years ago. And, and uh, a year and a half ago, and it was a beautiful journey. But I remember one of the things that stood out for me was that moment where myself and Ruth King, another woman who's been writing about mindfulness and race, we were both presenting there. And she offered to the audience in South Africa, outside of Johannesburg, that to do this work, we might actually need our own affinity spaces, or spaces where white racialized people can get together and feel, do their work, and people of color of different backgrounds might need the spaces so they can do their work. And the tension of trying to do it all together can be a little bit too much, so we need these spaces. To say that in South Africa, I, I just to say, I witnessed the like ripple of, wait, what? We, you, you mean to tell me it might be actually okay and necessary for us to have these spaces? And then all of a sudden it was like, well, okay, okay, yes, my goodness. This is all very hard to do all together. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, Yvonne, this is, this is, this is the work. And, and again, what's the personal curriculum? What's the best structure? And how do we do kind of multiple complex structures? How do we not just say, well, I'm going to go to my POC black woman group and stay there, but how can we do the both and, right? Sometimes, right, I'm not going to go to my white racialized white women's group and stay there. Well, I'm going to do that and. And I think that's where a lot of organizations have struggled. You know, people are first just figuring out, okay, we need affinity groups, okay. But then how do we come back together? How do we embed that in the work? And, and my book is really aimed at supporting that, um, Ooh, heartful courage to, to sort of do what we need to do, but keep moving toward love and healing. Healing ourselves and healing together. 
So thank you very much for that. A lifelong, right? It's practice of a life. Thank you, my dear. So I see a question, how can I best model mindful anti-racism to my children, my patients? Um, and OB and black women have twice the mortality. Oh. Again, lifelong. First step, asking the question as you're doing, honoring that. How can I best model? You know, the, as Rilke said, the hardest and best questions are not those that we answer like this, but that we work toward living the answer. So what does it look like? What does it really look, what, I often, there's something visceral in me against, a reactive against model, but really I switch it into embody or switch it into like live. How can I live anti-racism? In the presence of these divine beings we call children. How can we live that? It probably is, it involves, it's gonna involve, I will say for all of us, especially white racialized people, but it really part of the training of success. And I know it, it has different versions in different cultures. We gotta talk about this to the children. We have to talk about this to the children. Why do I take, say this? I've been teaching 20 somethings, mostly 20 somethings for 20 something years. And every year, it seems like a higher percentage come bereft. They don't know. They haven't, they've been like, you know, sheltered and their parents have tried to teach them well and raise them up to be strong and whatever. They don't know history. They are not used to talking about these issues of racism. Uh, what people of various backgrounds come to me and are just like, I, I don't, I, I, where do I even begin? So, um, there is, uh, the modeling is the, the teaching, the naming, the not shying away, but it begins with ourselves. We can't embody what, but we're not living in our own, for ourselves. So how do we do this for ourselves and then offer it? Yeah. Y'all, um, it's true. The disparities in healthcare, first of all, I do think of racism as a public health menace. Right, and and also a menace to healthcare in all settings, public, private, you name it. We know this. The data shows this. One of my friends in the work um, wrote the book Just Medicine. Some of you may be familiar with, and if you haven't seen this book, um, check it out again. Just Medicine, again detailing uh, the racial disparities in in in, in healthcare. Dana Matthew, um, colleague and law professor, friend of mine, wrote this book, Just Medicine, about bringing racial justice into this, that lens. So it is a problem, right? But it is deeply embedded like it is in law, right? I'm not, all of our institutions have done this, embedded racism in the, in, in the, in the, the DNA of the discipline, frankly. And I'm gonna say that and I'm gonna invite y'all to look into what that may mean. Cause I've looked into it for 20 years, looking at what it means for law. I think it, all of us, if we're really serious about living anti-racism, we've got to look right where we are. How have our disciplines embedded that? And then from there we can slowly, cause it's work of a lifetime, do the work to, uh, to dis, you know, dislodge it. But I'll tell you this, I wouldn't be, here if I didn't believe that this is work that is healing as we go. So it can feel like work, but when we do it together, not so much. Feels like building community, feels like helping raise the next generation in a way that will suffer a little bit less than we did. That's why we're here, beautiful. Look at this beautiful one that's just joined us. Yeah, I mean, this is why we're here. It's for, it's for you know, y'all know. It's because the planet is burning and we don't have much time to you know, mess around anymore. And so we're not, we're not gonna mess around. We're gonna teach the children in the ways that they need to heal the separations between us, the planet, each other, all of that. And um, this is just one piece of that. I think the work to heal racism is just one piece of the deep healing that humanity is being forced to confront at this moment. And I just wanna say how much I am grateful uh, for you. Again, 
in the work that you are doing to help support the healing. That is the inevitable, I'm going to say gift, though it's a painful one, maybe like childbirth, though I don't have my own children, I kind of have a feeling it's a beautiful gift, but a painful one. I think we're going through kind of a collective birth of something. It's going to be painful, but it's going to be beautiful. That's what I'm holding. And so being in this conversation with you is, is just a manifestation of a part of that for me. So thank you. And the sun is all in my face. So I'm going to move this way. <laughs> thank you. Rose, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, so if you need to jump off, I just wanted to express deep gratitude. Um, and that uh, for the other questions in the chat, um, can I email those to you or or if you have more time to spend with us, I can call people to ask you whatever you want to do, Professor. Um, how about one more question? And then um, you mean when you say more time, you mean now or later? Uh, uh, like now, if you wanted to do one more question. Yeah, and let's do one more, more question. And um, I'm happy to, anybody who wants to, help me figure out what's there's the one here um, your example of being on a flight with all women is the same example given by Werner Myers in a TED talk yeah mm, exactly yeah her work is is beautiful Henrietta Lacks um, I see another note about that oh exploitation mm. there's a beautiful question about anger um, ah. um, I would love oh to hear you explore, because I think it's something that comes up for a lot of people, how to transfer the anger into good energy, motivation, and devotion to continue to stand for racial and social justice instead of being tossed around. Yeah, well, so yeah. resonated. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'll just say that, you know, I start the book with this part that's just about grounding, right? And just recognizing the importance of, of practices that help us feel our ability to kind of down-regulate, self-regulate when we're feeling quite triggered, feel our ability to feel a sense of um, supportedness on this planet, even when we're feeling, um, whew, you know, the, the ground shifting. So groundedness in the groundlessness of courageous life. Courageous life is constantly changing. We know this, this is a complete impermanence. We never know to what tomorrow is going to bring. That's always been the case. I think oppressive cultures train the privileged to be uncomfortable with vulnerability. Okay. So part of what we're doing is saying, all right, we all know a little bit about that, but we're, we're trying to disrupt the patterns that we've been trained in. And I've been training them too. I, you know, I'm now, you know, a law professor, I've been trained in that kind of desire not to feel vulnerable. I think intense emotion is something we fear for many reasons. I've feared intense anger partly because I associated it with violence because I have some history that taught me some of that. But now I've learned that there is a difference between anger and violence. Violence is, I'm not here for that personally. I know there are people who are, but I, you know, I'm not here for that. But anger, okay, is just, to me, information. And um, there are ways I think we should be practicing more. I think there should be robust training around how to allow ourselves to, to kind of actually feel our anger and transform it into, yes, that energy. But it takes be, being safe enough and creating spaces where you can feel it and creating this normal normalization that we feel our anger. If people are not angry at this time on some level, like to me, mindfulness is not about pacifying us into like, we're just always in a bubble of ease and nah, 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 nah. no, <laughs> because why the world is, things are happening that if you care and if you're alive, you're gonna feel, and some of those feelings are gonna be sharp, like anger, rage, fear, um, grief. For me, it's been anxiety. I've never experienced anxiety like as a thing. I've, I've uh, had a lot of empathy, you know, empathy for it, understanding. But this year, <laughs> this year, 
I mean, I don't know if it was the combination of the things, but somehow that whatever that my students were telling me about, about what anxiety was, and there is a pandemic almost among our young people. And I think it might be associated with technology in some way, but it could be a lot of things. But more and more percentages of my law students have anxiety, diagnosed anxiety. And I would be hearing that and like honoring and trying to support them. But I wasn't feeling it myself until this year. And I firmly believe though, the body is here to be our best support and not to pacify, not to um, you know, numb ourselves out of what the body's messages are. So if we're angry, if we're anxious, there's probably a good reason too. So not to just move right out of it into the, like explore, ex inquire, examine, investigate. So the RAIN practice, recognize, accept, I'm angry, I'm feeling angry, investigate. What's the anger here to teach me? Our, and especially, you know, nonviolent communication training speak to how underneath anger is very often, see if it's true for you, some way in which a deeply held value is being trampled upon. So it does, you know, once we kind of become more clear about what's underneath the anger, mindfulness for me helps me see a range of options for how to respond, you know, how to choosing, right? Whatever habits, patterns, trainings we, we received as young people about how to, what, what anger meant. And again, for me, it was like violence might be next. Alcoholism might be next. You know, dem, you know I grew up in a house of trauma where, you know, my mother being struck might be next. So I actually had to train myself to have a kind of a more right relationship with anger, but also a right relationship with a certain kind of positive power that I have to meet my experiences and not be, um, you know, not be crushed by them, not be, you know, discombobulated by a feeling. It's just a feeling. It will pass. It will pass if you let it. It's when you squunch it down and nobody can talk about it that it sort of wreaks habit for most of us. When you turn it inward, it becomes depression and anxiety. But if you're like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, and allow yourself to have those feelings run, I exercise, you know, do the different things to kind of, um, you know, like the animal kingdom we've learned will do, shake it off literally, and then find your familiars, your natural kind of, I say, um, you know, interest-based sort of, I don't, tribe might not be the right word, but your community of practice and engagement around that thing that is driving you a little nuts, like that thing you'd like to see better, you'd like to see healed. So it might be coming together like this and just seeing that this is healing in a way. This is a way to move from just being angry to finding a group of folks who can help you do the next best, take the next best step. So yeah, I think we should probably be setting up some trainings around transforming anger. It comes up, it's coming up everywhere. It's been coming up really for the last number of years and I keep coming back to, yes, we really do need to do this together um, because it's a powerful emotion. And the last thing I want to just say here is, uh, you know, I think of Audre Lorde, you know, Black woman activist, poet, cancer survivor until, until she wasn't, um, who wrote a lot about the, the, the power of she called, she used the word erotic, but what she really meant when you read her was feeling, like feeling your feelings. Like that is a power. It is um, the job of oppression to kind of disconnect us from our feelings and keep us explaining, you know, like justifying our existence. Explaining again that racism exists like Cory Booker did today. It's like, at a certain point, we have to start living that freedom that says we're done explaining our existence as women, as people of color, you know, as kind hearted, soft bellied, vulnerable human beings that know that life is short. We're done explaining and we just want to start living these um, ways and practices of liberation. 
right? We're not gonna keep explaining. We're not gonna keep doing that. We're just, because the, the systems of oppression will keep requiring that of us. Prove it again. Can you do another study? Can you show us for sure? Can we do a climate study? It's like, <laughs> well, we can, but right now, right here, they want a freedom. I'm just, 400 years of, of inequality is a theme that a lot of us have been looking at, looking at um, 1619. And of course, it's, there've been lots of inequalities, but this is looking specifically at like anti-Black racism in America, 1619, the first ship of Africans who, we don't know exactly what their status was at that moment, but they quickly became enslaved people in the United States, in the colonies that became the United States, 1619. So 400th year, last year, and my friend, Angel Kyoto Williams, beautiful teacher, author of, co-author of Radical Dharma. She and I were talking and she was just like, this is, this is the theme that's coming up, like year one of liberation, year one. We have just got to start living like the grace and power of our free lives. We will continue to fight the injustice and we will continue to name the discrimination and all the stuff, but don't let it get in the way of us experiencing our power and our freedom because it's here right now. So I just want to say thank y'all. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> wow. I would be honored to set up trainings with you, professor. <laughs> I think they would be very well attended. Let's do something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a nice. I'm going to get off here. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity, Professor. So much gratitude. And I will be reaching out for sure shortly. Beautiful. Be well, thank be you. safe, stay connected, know your power. Thank you, Professor. Have a good night. <laughs> you too. <laughs> wow, everyone. I think I'm going to have to rewatch the video. There was just so much in there. Just wow. Um, I wanted to get to some of the uh, the questions that were asked before. Um, first of all, gratitude for all of you for coming here and, and showing up. And um, so, Miriam, do you want to do you want to ask your question? And I'm sure with our collective experience, we can we can come up with some semblance of an answer. And then also I'll be happy to, uh, to email Professor McGee these questions and um, communicate them back to all of you. Sure, I mean, I really enjoyed her chapter when the, you know, her student came to her and talked to her about like, what race am I, right? And how race is a social construct. Um, and it actually came up just yesterday. One of our, one of the other physicians was like, what? like what is race versus ethnicity and like why are we asking our patients all these questions and like they don't know we don't know why are we asking you know and while I recognize the importance of collecting that data and seeing the discrimination I also am you know I'm, I'm a little torn so, so go um, ahead and go into the app and say that you're here um yeah so anyway I'd love anybody's thoughts on you know tracking that information and usefulness of it um if anyone does any research in that area. So I don't do research in the area, but I know that um, race identification um, is, has arbitrarily in some respects been made to be kind of important on pulmonary function testing because of the trunk to leg ratio in different races. And that informs the quote unquote, normal values of what our, our total lung capacities are. Um, so there's that kind of race tracking method is like, and, and even that in and of itself could be um, flat out racism. Number one, you're, you get a number one on that race block if you're Caucasian and then two for everyone else. So like even something as subtle as that um, so I think going into like PFTs and seeing and tracking um, one versus twos. And then I bet that they would correlate with um, different incidences of comorbidities. I mean, like we know that 
um, there's more asthma in uh, more urban inner city areas with socioeconomically challenged um, persons, right? So, so yeah, from, from my pulmonary standpoint, um, that I think that's easily tracked with just PFTs, for instance. Trish, did you want to comment on on that? <laughs> I'm gonna call Trish out because she's also one of my teachers. <laughs> I think it's an interesting question that I don't have an answer for because I'm not studying this, but there's certainly, it's interesting because there's a political push at the moment to take this kind of tracking out, which takes us back to color blindness, right. rather than differentiation um, in terms of understanding different groups have been inherently discriminated against and therefore needing resources if it's used for resources and, and um, where funds are directed um, and we don't have that kind of information, then we do become colorblind and we become blind and, and or rather lack insight. Um, I'm, I think languaging as I speak is also really interesting, right? Because sight and how we see and how we label um, and using our capacity to see or not to see also labels those that are blind. And um, so even that languaging for me is, is tricky as I hear myself speak. Um, what, I, what I would say is that the questions are important. The discussions are important. The continuation to have these discussions. There was a, a question here about some, um, what, what was it? About working with black elders in the community and skepticism around care. And um, one of the, one of the, the lessons I learned last year, stepping very gingerly into this conversation um, because I am not American born. And so my, as Rhonda McGee says, our, our how, we, how our identity is formed has a lot to do with our backgrounds and, and, and how we come to that. So I come to this issue of race and ethnicity from a very different perspective, but it's always been one of privilege that I've had to learn over time. And stepping into this conversation very blithely last year, thinking I had something to say about mindfulness and white culture, I was asked by a person in the audience about how uncomfortable I was presenting. Um, and I completely misunderstood the question as a white person. And I, what was being asked of me was as a white person, I always occupied this place of privilege and power. And I never had to really deal with discomfort. So unless we step into any of these questions and conversations that we have around race, gender, privilege, bias, and, and constantly feel discomforted, we're not doing the work of anti-racism. We're doing the work of being colorblind or culturally diverse or inclusive, but not the actual anti-racism work. Um, I don't. I think that's a very long-winded contribution to your question, Mi Chang. But, no, but I think it's awful, just okay. just stepping into this, having these questions, having these conversations, feeling discomforted, means we're potentially on the road to thinking about this in a, in a different way, in a, in a way that's ethical um, and, cons and considers the place of the person in front of us that we're, that we're thinking about this with. Yeah, I was talking to a white male friend. I don't know why I had to, but you're talking about like the, um, 
you know, the higher mortality in Black women, uh, maternal mortality. And for me, it was really about stress and racism and the trauma. And I was like, this is why, right? And he was like, no, it's because they're single and, you know, um, don't feed their kids right. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then he was using all, you know, the race stuff that he collected, you know, from other research studies to kind of justify his point of view. And then I was trying to use you know, my perspective, for, you know, to justify my point of view. And it was very interesting. So then I was wondering, like, is this hurting or harming to like, <laughs> so. I just wanted to make a quick comment. I don't know, um, I'm an internist, so I don't know um, uh, the details of the PFTs and the GFRs and all of that. But I do know that um, I had an interesting discussion, a book club uh, last week on a book called Medical Apartheid, which I would recommend those of you who haven't read it to please read. Um, it is very painful and that's, I'm not a black woman and it was extremely painful. So I can only imagine um, for my colleagues, um, but it really just highlights the systemic racism from in the history of American medicine, uh, you know, going back to 1619 and it's uh, horrifying and eye-opening and really makes you understand why we are where we are today in medicine. And it makes us all very uncomfortable because we all went into medicine to help. And the history of how much hurt we have done is shocking, but I think it should be required reading for all medical students. But anyways, in that discussion, um, we had um, one of our, actually our Dean for Diversity who is much more learned on this than I am. And she was explaining that for the GFR in particular, that that was based on an assumption of, um, of Blacks having higher muscle mass that actually hasn't been borne out by modern science. And um, that actually, that they think that some of the higher incidence of chronic kidney disease in our Black population in America is because of the GFR uh, correction for being African-American. Um, and so um, there actually is a, a campaign to change that. And she mentioned that the science behind the PFT differences also is not that strong, but like I said, I don't know the details of it. So it's probably worth us looking into all of this. And really uh, it's, I've been trying to wrap my head around these, this idea, but I've really you know, had to embrace this idea of you know, race really as a social construct and, and nothing more. Um, I think it's probably critical to how we view our patients moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to, I think was it Cheryl's point about this inherent mistrust that some of us have faced with regards to um, uh, Blacks in the community towards um, non-Black healthcare professionals. Um, I think the, the acknowledgement and um, having those difficult conversations is like step number one is to simply acknowledge that that they for good reason don't trust the current inherently kind of racistly embedded medical system um, from which they're supposed to get quality care in. So thank you for bringing that up, Cheryl. I, I think that's, that's a really important point. Um, from my own practice and just kind of being on my very beginning journey towards this, especially for those of you who um, work with mixed populations, whether or not you are or aren't in healthcare, I'm going to invite you from a mindfulness um, lens to notice what arises for you as you're taking care of or teaching or working with a black indigenous person of color. Um, and then notice if there are any fine or blatant nuances in terms of how you treat or teach them versus someone who is Caucasian. I think just that awareness and desire to change. And I myself do this with, um, with even like insurances and payer mixes. And that in and of itself is, it's kind of like health discrimination in some respects. Like, you know, which payers are going to be able to provide whatever quality inhaler or drug versus an underserved population having a different insurance and what their resources are limited to. 
and albeit some of it is not within our control in terms of what kind of um, quote unquote prescription drug coverage they do and don't have, but um, can we start taking note of this? Not from a self-critical lens, but simply from an awareness perspective. Um, and I think cultivating that mindful awareness is simply step number one. And then having conversations like this that I hope that this is just the beginning of so that we really can start moving the needle on such embedded racism in our society today so that we can come to some semblance of racial justice, like if not for us, then for the future generations. So I wanted to thank everyone. Um, our time is, um, is, is up. Thanks for staying on over. Um, such a rich, wonderful discussion and um, stay tuned for other mindful healthcare and healing collective events. And I'd love to make um, race dialogue as part of our like monthly offerings. Like this is not going to just be a one-off. So thank you for being part of the solution. Deep bow of gratitude for all of you. And I'll hang out here if there's any any questions and the, the chat will be um, will be recorded and so um, I'll be able to pass the other questions along to Professor McGee.